clearly some of some of us are us, you know um, some of us in the audience have got diabetes so clearly um, you know this is a worrying time for all of us um, and I was just going to give you the up-to-date data but my top line is um, is that actually the overall absolute risk for people with diabetes still remains relatively low because um, just because we have you know somebody has diabetes doesn't mean to say that if they get COVID they're going to you know have succumb to this um, the chances are still relatively low um, they're slightly higher than the average and of course many risk factors come into uh, certainly in the UK that factor in that creates a risk there are some unknowns um, certainly um, there is age of course is by far the biggest risk factor as for diabetes if you have type 2 compared to the average person it's twice the risk so if you remind you know if you just put that into your minds that actually having said all of that you know age is something we can't change and um, the risk for diabetes on average is double it is it is slightly higher in terms of comparison at a younger age but it becomes less with older age with diabetes and I can explain that in questions if you want, but by and large, um, what we found in Scotland, the absolute risk in diabetes was still very relatively low because, if, you know, the risk for COVID severity, first, you need to develop the infection, and then there are multiple other things that come into this. If you have diabetes without any other chronic kidney disease or heart disease or heart failure, your risk is, is, is not double, it's probably somewhat less, it's about maybe 20, 30% higher. Once you get some other comorbidities, it goes up. And it's exactly the same that you would see for risk for, if we take COVID out of the equation, if we look at risk for, you know, say that um, 10 years ago, we were looking at risk for cardiovascular disease. The risk for cardiovascular disease depends on, um, in people with diabetes, depends on all the, all, all the risk factors added together. So your blood pressure, um, whether an individual smokes, um, their sugar levels, their body mass index, um, whether they've got kidney disease or, and so on. And, the, and, and you put all of these together is what creates a risk. So that's, that's kind of the, the, the key point of this is the things that differ about um, the risk for COVID compared to normal is that men, um, normally men are about 20% high risk of, of dying from any cause. So I hope I don't scare people by saying these things, but, but when, when for COVID, the male risk is much higher. It's probably around about 80 to 100% more than women. So it's much higher than the average. So COVID severity is certainly affecting men more than women. I think that's a reality. Um, it's also clearly, as you all know, um, and as the early pandemic lockdown showed in the UK, um, that disproportionately more blacks and South Asians were, were, were succumbing to the disease. And, Part of that risk is certainly in some parts of the UK um, was because of our, uh, you know, it was partly linked to social deprivation and other factors like social factors. And if you, if you take that away, the excess risk in South Asians seemed to be confined to men. Um, and that risk was halved if you adjusted for social factors and it almost went away completely in women. So, you know, that's kind of interesting. And, and the excess risk was somewhat higher in, in Black, Afro-Caribbean and African-Americans than it was even in South Asians, once you did adjust for all the other factors. Um, the other things that were associated with risk was your body mass. Um, and it looks like there's a sort of straight line upwards. By the time you get to a BMI of 30, the risk looks around about double. By the time you get to BMI 35, maybe four times higher of being admitted to ITU. Um, for severe COVID, um, and that's in the general population. What it looks like in South Asians, um, there's only preliminary data from UK Biobank, which we published. And again, it, again, it looks like the higher the BMI, the higher the risk. But remember, that's only one factor. Other, every, all factors coming together. And um, the way this disease works is that in some people, for some reasons we just don't understand, is that the virus leads their immune response to become too exaggerated. And when that happens, the body releases these proteins called cytokines in such an, ex uh, an excessive amount beyond what the body's needs are. And those cytokines can then um, lead to damage to your, cardio you know, your blood vessel systems, your cardiovascular system. It can, it can, it, 
it also increases substantially the thickness of the blood because the body almost seems to think um, it, it's being attacked and it's going to have lots of bleeding. So it thickens the blood up and it thickens it so much it blocks lots of the small blood vessels that supply many different organs such as your, you know, such as your kidneys, your, your liver, your, you know, your, <clears throat> partly your heart, your lungs. And that's why you get what's known as lots of thrombi all over the place. And, <clears throat> and that's why, <clears throat> excuse me, unlike pneumonia, this, this disease is affecting multiple other organs beyond the lungs. And it's probably also the reason that if you're an individual who's already has perhaps heart disease or kidney disease or is carrying a bit too much weight and carrying too much weight is associated with less ability for the lungs to take oxygen. It's associated with thicker blood to begin with. You can then see how these things multiply in the, it, it, when you get this hyperimmune response. If that makes sense. Um, I did mention about deprivation, so that's certainly a key factor, certainly in the UK. Remember the most, there is a strong gradient of obesity by deprivation in the UK. There's a strong gradient of overcrowding by deprivation. Um, some parts of our communities are poorer, as you know, particularly Pakistanis, I think, in the UK and, and, and Bangladeshis in some parts. Um, I think most of us on this call are more, you know, aff relatively affluent and privileged and e educated, but I think you understand what I mean by those things that, you know, th these are reality factors. And also some of the jobs that, you know, some of the South Asians, they're outwardly facing shop, you know, shops, buses, um, you know, the type of jobs and, you know, and that perhaps also is partly relevant. And we also published a paper in UK Biobank that suggested some of that risk was social factors and jobs, but it wasn't completely explained uh, by those factors. So there's other things going on. And one of the other things that might be relevant, and part of the reason we're talking, it might be that, you know, having a slightly higher diabetes rate might be part of the relevance for why South Asia is at slightly higher risk, at least in the context of the UK, uh, as we face the infection. Uh, for men versus women, it's double the risk, and diabetes is about in threefold and twofold. I've talked about, you know, social deprivation and how, and you can understand why that might be, is because if you have smaller houses, smaller rooms, You've got less physical distancing. Um, and in our communities as well, there's more multicultural, not multicultural, you know, there's multi-generational um, mixing as well that pos you know, was potentially a problem. Um, so the point I was making is, as, as individuals, the key thing is you're doing your best to keep your sugars in good, good order. And I think that helps. And there is an, an association between higher sugar levels and potentially worse outcomes. We've, we've showed that in the UK data. There's two papers in press in the Lancet Diabetes, which your good uh, colleague Kamlesh Kunti was also involved in and I was involved in. Um, we do our best, and I think you should all do your best, clearly, you know, to keep your blood pressure uh, under control and cholesterol levels well managed. And I think, you know, most of you are, are you're all trying to do that. And the only other thing I would say, we can't change our risks substantially from what we are, but, you know, keeping our risk factors well controlled, good compliance with our medications, and the only other thing I would say is that if you have an opportunity to get out and walk a little bit more, I think that benefits because you're going to, by that mechanism, keep, increase your, you know, mm. keep your fitness reasonably good, um, your cardiorespiratory fitness. And if you have an opportunity um, to have a bit more Vimto, then I would do that because I'm just kidding. Um, but, you know, to eat slightly better. And I mean, very small changes and the kind of changes, I, I mean, I'm speaking to an audience. I think that most of you know what the good diet is. Um, but it's never that easy because we're all tempted by different things. But um, if you want to make small changes, uh, I've written a one-page leaflet of all the evidence-based things that work. And it's, it's all the obvious things, cut sugary drinks, as I suspect all of you have done to replace by diet or water. Um, cut, you know, diet, you know, calorie-rich drinks like lattes and replace by tea or coffee or, or um have smaller portion sizes, um, you know, replace confectionery a little bit of, you know, by all means, we've got to have some confectionery, some treats and the like, but maybe have slightly less or eat slower and replace by a bit of fruit or veg or, you know, those kind of things that all work or, or narrow the window of, you know, time where you eat um, or eat more fiber. There's lots of things that are evidence-based that definitely work. And that's probably the only thing I would say to you. Is, and the final thing is, what is good, the two things that are going to be game changers, as you know, um, one, 
um, is getting a vaccine. And there are, as you heard, lots of hopeful um, noises in the community that that's going to happen. And the second thing is if, and, and I know that many people in the community are trying to develop a very, very rapid test for having current COVID-19, because if we could develop that, then we can shut down, we can test people as they go into different you know, localities, restaurants, hotels, potentially you know, universities, schools, um, you know, a rapid test that within about two minutes can tell you whether somebody has or has not got COVID. And that would, because that's the thing that we're missing. And the reason that this infection is so difficult to get a hold on is because a lot of people are asymptomatic and therefore spreading the disease without knowing it before. And, and that is a big, big issue. And even people who get mm. symptoms, they're, develop, they're getting the disease and they're probably spreading the disease a few days before they get the actual symptoms. And, and it's, that's the reason why this thing is spreading and we can't really grasp it properly, as I would say.